take you from the clouds down to the earth very fast. Um, so uh, our company, we're a semiconductor company. We're doing some really neat things. Um, as you go through this, a lot of what, uh, what John said and what uh, <coughs> uh, Katni said will become obvious as we go through this. And you know, things like open source, bridge, uh, and we're the underlying technology that we believe is going to power the next generation of this stuff. So let's get to it. Uh, I'll start at, at the HCL level, where people talk about IT services. Um, there's an there's a obvious but very important uh, piece of data. Lots of money being spent between now and 2015 in terms of global IT services. Um, what is going to drive that? Well, people like us who build semiconductors are going to outsource stuff that is not core to us. For instance, if we're going to do EDA tools or if we're going to do ERP type stuff, it's all going to be outsourced. So BPO stuff being outsourced. And I'll call it the notion of a uh, um, super vertical service provider. So who would that be? Well, you know, uh, if I look at guys like Google today, they are a super vertical service provider. Guys like Netflix. Um, of course, Netflix uses Amazon to do all their hosting. But if you start to think about Apple and Google and, and Amazon with Fire and Kindle, Everything from consumer devices to enterprise to email to things that are office-like are all going to the cloud. So very large spending moving out to the cloud. Um, we've talked about this. I won't spend too much time on it. If you look at today, you have basically four major blocks that make up uh, uh, the enterprise IT evolution, right? So it started off with virtualization. VMware was born five, six years ago. This notion of a private cloud where people wanted to control things keep things so that IT managers, uh, the evil people who live in IT, essentially have full control over all the stuff that you and me do. They know where we are. They know how to provision your stuff. But most importantly, uh, again, privacy, information, uh, and, and the ability to drive that into the hybrid cloud, as these gentlemen talked about, is very key. Because there are some things that really don't need to be that private. Uh, it's funny, people, when Google started off offering Gmail, or other people like Microsoft started offering Office. Believe it or not, Office was offered before Gmail in the cloud. They didn't call it the cloud, but nobody was concerned about Microsoft reading your email. But now there was a notion of Google reading your email, but that's all moved fast. And we're now in this notion of this hybrid model where we get public and private, cl private clouds interacting with each other. So if I were to look at all this stuff, and, and I think a lot has been said on this, the one thing that I wanted to take away from this is that centralized computing Large structured data this morning, we've talked about unstructured data, really big unstructured data, consumer devices, as he talk, talked about the kitchen sink of all experiences on every platform have to be managed. And, and most importantly, I don't think there's any notion of time relative to data being relevant. You want to be able to go back and forth in time and be very real time oriented. Location is, non, is a non-issue anymore. People want to access their data anywhere. People want to be able to do business anywhere. So I think there's a very large uh, change in terms of what the IT model is going towards. So if I look at what happens tomorrow, well, um, you know, I think it's clear that this whole notion of the cloud is going to encompass our interaction. And as, as these people have said here before, and, and this whole conference has evolved, it's better to embrace it because that's the only way to basically drive growth and drive experience, right? Um, I will uh, give you one other piece of uh, important information here. Um, I think if you look at any survey that's been done in the last probably half a year, uh, everybody's basically saying that you will have a huge portion of infrastructure, whether it's guys at JP Morgan and Morgan Stanley in the financial sector, folks like Brocade, folks like us who are small compared to all these other guys, Everybody wants to save. In other words, the only way to sustainably operate your business and to leverage all of the incredible technology that's out there is to move a lot of the pieces into the cloud. Right? So now let me get down to something that is uh, very important. If you're going to provide an infrastructure that starts to encompass and starts to blend in all of the information that you want, one of the biggest things you need to be concerned about is energy. I don't know who said this this morning at the plenary, but uh, I think it was one of the gentlemen who said that energy is the ultimate resource constraint. So 
Let me boil it down to what our friends at EPRI, EPRI is, is an organization that's nonprofit. They're called the Electric Power Research Institute. They compile data on data centers and the energy usage within data centers. So uh, on the x-axis is efficiency, on the y-axis is absolute usage, or absolute power. So let's talk with the, to the guys who are very efficient, who make infrastructure their business. If you look at Google or Amazon or Facebook, every time on your Facebook, or you're on your Facebook wall, Facebook loses money, so they gotta make sure that their servers are running very, very cool, and they're losing money unless you buy something as a result of you looking at your Facebook page. So when P&L matters, they're very efficient, they build their own stuff, and, and as John said earlier on, there's this big open source initiative. We love it. Uh, what I'm gonna tell you about later is, is absolutely square in the middle of making sure that clouds can be sustainable. Lots of energy, hundreds of megawatts, very efficient guys. Apple, Google, Amazon, Yahoo, et cetera. And then you, and by the way, they, they have dedicated IT resources, big unstructured data. Their entire P&L is based on their ability to control their infrastructure. Now you have the rest of the world. And by the way, that includes guys like the Sheratons, the Marriott's, the hospitals. These guys are highly inefficient. But they, guess what? They constitute a majority of the market, and they are going to drive IT spending, and they are going to be the guys driving cloud outsourcing, right? So these guys, by the way, they're really, really inefficient, almost a factor of two inefficient compared to the dedicated data center guys. Guess what? But they're the guys who have a majority of the money and the energy spent on these services, right? So, well, what is the common factor here? The common factor here is that service delivery comes at a price. And what is that price? This is staggering, guys. It's a hundred, roughly $100 million per day increment spent on energy and equipment every day in the cloud infrastructure. And guess what? It gets worse because in five to six years, it's going to be 6x. Okay? So let me just go back. TCO, total cost of ownership, the biggest, most important Big, 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 big gargantuan topic on every data center guy's head. So this is very critical. So what are we going to do? Well, we have to fundamentally rethink what, what drives TCO. What drives TCO? It's guys who build chips like us and guys who build hardware like Brocade. And so between the chips, the fiber optics, and all of the fundamental silicon technology, we are at a very, very important precipice, and we have to make a very important disruption to fundamentally change TCO. So what did we think about? Well, this comes from a, my friend at Stanford. He's a very big professor. He's a Google fellow. Uh, his name is Christoph Kozirakis. So I want to give him credit here. He said, well, you got to make sure that integration starts to really make sense. Today, we are an x86-dominated world, $15 billion Intel market for servers. And what do they do? They sell you 30-year-old technology based on an 8086 PC that was never meant to build a cloud infrastructure. Well, good or bad, that's the way it is, right? So you got to have better integration, much lower latency, better quality of service, efficient cores. So what I'm about to tell you about is basically what we've done is take the technology in this phone and supersize it to be the next generation of server, right? And then, of course, virtualization. Well, you know, every time people in the IT world talk about virtualization, they want to make sure that I have the maximum number of contexts spread across the minimum amount of energy and the number of cores, right? So let's take a step forward and see, well, what do people do? Here's an example of C-Micro. C-Micro, a venture-funded startup, do a lot of cool stuff for next-generation cloud computing. And what did they do? Well, they built a server that's based on a, on a very unique concept essentially give you lots of cores and be able to interconnect those cores with very low latency, very low power, and completely rethink the notion of a distributed warehouse-scale computer. What did they do? Well, they've done some pretty neat stuff. They've taken, rack, they've taken and simplified the design of a cloud server, right? Obviously, smaller, one-quarter the power, one-third the weight, and in most cases for next generation, people want to build fanless equipment. Now take that forward, what did we do? Well, about two and a half years ago, um, a group of us at Applied Micro said, this company has a great balance sheet, we need to do something disruptive in the silicon space. And we decided to take on Goliath, which was Intel. So we went to Cambridge, we talked to the ARM guys, and we said, guys, why don't you and us work on building a 64-bit real server class ARM processor? So imagine taking all the DNA that lies in your iPhone and your iPad, and really, really building it to leverage all the low power characteristics of ARM, but giving you performance that's x86 class. 
So we did that, and about two weeks ago, we actually booted the first LAMP-based open source server at the ARM conference on the world's first 64-bit ARM 3 gigahertz machine, right? So we are taking computing to the next level. So we have a revolutionary CPU, all grounds up, no legacy, no x86, 30-year-old, 8086 stuff, all from scratch. By the way, all the Google guys, all the Amazon guys, everybody and anybody who's in this space wants an alternative to x86. And we did exactly that. So next year, you will see boxes, one rack unit, million unit sessions being hosted on this type of device. Superscalar, quad issue, full CPU, fully virtualized, everything grounds up. Just to give you an example, an 8086 has to have three times more area on silicon because of the 1981 Wintel connection. We fundamentally rethought CPUs with ARM, right? So we also said no 32-bit, no WIMP cores because everybody at Google and Amazon and company complained about WIMP cores. We said, let's make a real machine. Let's give AMD and Intel a run for their money. And that's exactly what we did, right? We didn't stop there. We said, we've got to do better than that. What else takes up power? Storage interfaces, network I.O., all the backplane stuff, all the fiber optics. Well, our company started off building long-haul telecommunications semiconductors. To us, a 100-gig interface is something that we take for granted. We build this stuff with one of the best mixed signal teams in the world. So we said, let's change the entire chipset hierarchy on a blade. Why does the Phi have to be separate? Why do we have to have a network adapter that's outside the main CPU complex? So not only did we build a 128 core fabric, so we can have 128 cores on one logical fabric. And on silicon, we can go 8, 16, 32, only limited by silicon, but we also decided to integrate all of the networking I.O. on one die. So to us, a blade becomes a chip. A rack becomes a series of chips rather than a series of blades. Imagine the scale that we're building by basically changing the fundamental architecture of a server. Now, I'll add one, one other piece of really, really important I, I.O. that we want to talk about. I'm sorry, one other piece of really important technology we want to talk about. Everybody in the cloud space wants to have applications that are either uh, a, a kitchen sink, mobile, all of the different types of applications that have different quality of service requirements for you to experience what you want to experience on your mobile device. For that, something as simple as TCP offload or something as simple as how do I make sure that I have a rendering engine in the cloud? Well, what did we do? We added all of the accelerators that you would need to make sure that things like TCP, MDP, all of the ICMP requests and protocols that you would, you would put on a server can be tweaked and tuned. That's what Google does, that's what Facebook does. Memcached is all about tweaking and tuning existing open source code. So we added, apart from our big ARM cluster of processors, we added a bunch of small processors that essentially let our customers customize their server and their applications on these blades. So put it all together, well, it took our DNA, which is all of our mixed signal, all of our high performance computing DNA, revolutionary ARM core, and fundamentally made the cloud, or will make the cloud affordable and more accessible. So guys like Rackspace, guys like Amazon, guys like Yahoo and Google and people who are running these clouds can actually envision very, very, very TCO efficient servers. In fact, we had, when we did the ARM launch, it was very interesting. A bunch of the industry and analysts came to us and said, guys, if you can do even half of what you're saying, you'll take a 25 to 30% bite out of that $100 million of increment per day, right? So how does this all, you know, what is this about, how is this related to the idea and what do you need, what is gonna happen relative to IT services? Well, if I give you a platform that is supported by a billion mobile uh, cores out there, huge software ecosystem, I give you the best possible integration, the best possible TCO. Combine that with all the applications, and by the way, it is going to become an ARM world. It is already an ARM world with the number of cell phone and, and, and mobile applications out there, right? So you can build, a company can build a fully bundled one-stop shop that addresses all of the requirements for private, public, or hybrid clouds. And what, what will this do to guys like HCL? Well, I took a shot at this, and I said, let me take a shot at what HCL could do with something like this. Well, today you have IBM and Amazon and a bunch of other guys who are offering cloud services. They offer value on top of what the infrastructure 
that is provided by them, right? Well, clearly companies like HCL can do the same because once we change the commoditization point and the TCO point of a server, well, we've unlocked a whole bunch of potential for companies in the service space to start to vertically integrate things and become better outsource partners. So that concludes my presentation, and if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Thank you.